Aleluya. And we're going to get right into it this morning. If you're here for the first time, we welcome you. We pray that you enjoy the service. Hallelujah. We are starting off, this is the four and a half months today for this series and the power of imagination. And I think it's a timely message because there's a warfare, there's a war going on for your imagination. Amen. Our lives are dictated by our imagination. If you are full of fear, you don't do anything. If you're suspicious, you shut yourself down away from everybody else. You live according to the dictates of your imagination. The only way you live according to the dictates of your faith, if your imagination and your faith line up together. Your imagination and your faith need to line up together if you're going to live the life that God wants you to live and not the life you imagine in your mind. Our imagination can make us believe lies, walk in fear, create mental and physical sickness. It can also create success, peace of mind, and harmony in our lives. It's not the people around you. It's not the money that you have in your bank. It's not the security that you think you have. It's your imagination that creates this. There are individuals that are living in countries that are, you know, I hate that term, third world country, right? But for lack of a better term, I'm going to use that, that have total peace of mind, total confidence in God, yet they don't have half of what we have. It's our imagination that creates our reality. See, your reality and my reality are two different things. And I have just been under attack since COVID started from in the church members that are no longer here, people that I thought were friends of mine that wanted to condemn me and judge me and criticize me for putting people's lives at risk by keeping the church open and my position on COVID. And, 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 and the fact of the matter is, I cannot live my life or preach according to their imagination. Amen. How many follow what I'm talking about? I happen to believe in an almighty God. I, I don't ever, and I, I say this again and again and again, I am not dis, disputing or, or dismissing the, uh, uh, the virus. I'm not dismissing the deaths. I'm dismissing the fear behind it. I'm dismissing how it's dividing people. It's dividing churches. It's dividing families. Amen. It, it, you know, uh, it, it's the fear that's behind it. And our imagination is, is, is magnifying it and making it worse than it is. On a side note, it is political as well. Hallelujah. <laughs> Turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's going to come out one day. Amen. It has been coming out. You just ain't been seeing it. Right. Your imagination creates these things. Let's read Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's a whole message in itself right there. But I'm not focusing on that right now. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. Your imagination needs to be cleansed. And it's cleansed by the word of God. Your imagination is uh, uh, infected. Your imagination is developed. And your imagination is uh, 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 um, creating fear and destruction in your life because it's not being cleansed by the word. It's being fed by media. It's being fed, fed by what's going on in society. It's being fed by the prices at the gas pumps. It's being fed by, you know, the, the times we're living in. And your imagination is making things worse and worse and worse for you. I like what the Bible says, as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. There's a segment of people that are not controlled by this fear. The same segment of people that are not controlled by this fear are the same segment of people that are not controlled by all the plagues that came upon e Egypt. God's chosen. They chose to believe God, and they were not impacted by the diseases and the destruction that was all over Egypt. When you have fear and confidence in God, you cannot, you will not be impacted by the diseases and the, uh, 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 and the imaginations of this world today. You are what's called in the protectus, protective witness program. Amen. 
When you are in the protective witness program, nobody gets you. So I'm in Psalms 91. He that abides under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. We are in the protective, that's a hard thing to say, protective witness program. Amen. But if your imagination's running away with you and you're fearing everything that they say on the news, and some of y'all just need to stop watching the news. Amen. You just need to stop watching it. When your imagination is cleansed by the word, we don't see people as enemies. Come on, I want to talk real to you right now. Because some believers in here right now have an attitude and a problem with other people. When your imagination has been cleansed, you don't have a problem with people. You see them as God sees them. Hurt, abused, and full of pain. And what do people that, act like, that have those issues going on in their body act like? They lash out. And when you do not have your imagination washed by the, washed by the word, you act back. I've got lines and lines and lines of people from before COVID, but I'm going to start at COVID, but they, 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 that have attacked me, verbally said things against me, and when I see them, I will go up to them, God bless you, how you doing, it's good to see you. I have nothing against them, because my imagination has been cleansed, they're not attacking me, they're attacking the message, because they don't understand the message. So shoot the messenger. When your imagination has been cleansed. You don't see people as your enemy. Yeah. Come on. That's true. Again, I'm talking to church members at El Shaddai. I'm talking to church members that are watching. Yeah. Yeah. Watching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Other churches, I'm talking to them. You don't see your brother and sister as enemy. You don't see them as a challenge. You don't see them as a threat. Amen. Jesus never saw any of his disciples as a threat. He never saw any of his disciples as a challenge. Paul never thought, seen any of his disciples as a threat or a challenge. Timothy was rising up, and he helped him rise up. Today, when somebody tries rising up, and you think they're going to get better than you, you push them down. Because your imagination's been, not been cleansed. You ought to push them forward. Let them shine. Let the, let the glory of God manifest through them. But when your imagination not been cleansed, you think the world is against you. I know I'm not going to get a lot of amens on that one. I thought the whole world, I thought worlds were created to be against me before I got saved, before God cleansed my imagination. Before, when your imagination's uh, 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 not been cleansed, you see every problem as destructive. When your imagination's cleansed, you see every problem as an opportunity for God to shine. So guess what the consequence of that is? A lot less uh, complaining. A lot less frustration, a lot more trust. See, our problem is not faith. The Bible says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, be thou removed, and it shall be done. We all have faith. You sat in that chair without testing it. You got in your car without checking it. You eat your food without investigating it. How many go to restaurants and eat? McDonald's. They do some dirty stuff there. Amen. But yet you go there and you eat that Big Mac like you cooked it. You're taking faith that they handled your food properly. I have a sister-in-law that can't look at, eat nothing unless she smells it, looks at it, and there's certain places she won't go eat because her imagination runs wild with her. It's not our faith, it's our imagination. And we have spent... Hundreds of years developing our faith and letting our imagination run wild with us. And our imagination is destruct, dis destroying us. Your imagination is fed and develops by what you feed it. So what have you been feeding your imagination this week? Has it been everything that's on the news? Or have you been washing it with the water of the word? So I listen to the, I am a news junkie. I watch all of them. I watch CNN, I watch Max News, I watch Liberal, and I watch uh, Conservative News, because I don't want just one point of view, yeah. right? But I wash my mind with the word after I listen to it, because they will make you, uh, man, they'll have me wearing tinfoil hats. <laughs> Amen, thinking the aliens are coming to get me, man. <laughs> you know, if, if you live your life by the news, yeah? You have to live your life by the word. And you can't do that if, unless your mind has been washed by the word and it's only it, your, your, your imagination develops by what you feed it. If you feed it fear, you're going to live in fear. 
You feel, you, you feel agitation, you're agitated with everybody and everything and all you dwell about and all you think about is how everybody agitates you and everybody's stupid. Are you that kind of person? Everybody's stupid but you? Hallelujah. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, let's read. Your imagination function, functions by the nutrients you feed it. You know, a plant, you know, there are some plants you need to, you know, water and air is not enough. You need to give it some nutrients. You need to fix the soil. You need to put vitamins in it for whatever reason. Just some plants are like that. All right. You need the proper nutrients to develop your imagination. All right. Uh, we call it having a balance. All right. And, uh, you know, the problem with balance is if you're too spiritual, people think you're out of balance. Amen. I think they're out of balance by not being spiritual. Philippians 4, 8. Let's read. For the rest, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is worth, worthy of reverence and honorable and seemingly... Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious. If there be any virtue and any excellence, if there be anything worthy of praise. What? What? Think? What have you been thinking about? You been thinking about how somebody did you wrong? Been thinking about how somebody, no, they're no good, they don't like me, I don't like them either. Are you thinking about uh, uh, the injustices of the world? The world is not fair. The world is unjust. Deal with it. Handle it. The problem with our society today, this whole generation of, of young kids, man, they think the world has to be fair and they can't handle losing nothing. They can't handle losing a game. They can't handle losing a, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, so they get a pick up a gun and they kill them. Life's not fair. Life is not fair. Deal with it. God gives you the ability and the strength to overcome it. But your imagination will drive you down that path that life's not being fair and everything needs to be equal. It's not going to be equal. Life is what you make of it by the power of God within you. Not on your own. Think and weigh and take account of these things and fix your mind. Fix your mind. You know why it says fix your mind? Because our mind will always gravitate towards the negative. Our mind will always gravitate towards the injustices. Our mind will always gravitate towards what, it been, uh, what we didn't like being done to us. Let's forget about what you did to everybody else. That don't matter. You know, I, I, I crack up when people come up to me and they say, well, well, you know what, Pastor Mike, you did this and you said this and I didn't like this and I didn't like it. I have to bite my tongue. I said, dude, you just don't know what you've done. But I'm the bad guy. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know what that means? On a regular basis, we need to consistently and continuously be recalibrating our thought process. Because what's the first thing that comes down your mind, right? right? We go home today and you put the news on. Yeah. Gavin Newsom said there's a lockdown and a mask mandate. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Yeah. Nothing positive. Yeah. How dare him? I, I ha I'd have to fight that one too. You know, my imagination is that much in control that I'm just going to accept it because I'm going to, Think on these things. An uncleansed um, uh, uh, imagination that's not been washed by the word causes believers to stay stuck right where they're at. I've been saved for like 40 years. It's a long time. I've learned a little thing or two in those 40 years. And one of the things that amazes me more than anything else is how many people have remained the same in the last 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. There's been no growth. There's been no process in their life. They're church members, and they've always been church members. They'll always be a church member. Ministry not developed in them. Their relationship with God hasn't developed. They still have the same problems with their children, their wife, their finances. Everything they had is in the day they got saved. That's not the kind of God we serve. They're selfish and separate themselves, and they still selfish and separate themselves. They don't get involved. But yet they profess to be a part of the body of Christ. Because these are individuals whose minds have not, whose imaginations have not been cleansed. I want you to turn your Bibles with me now to, uh, got lost here for a second. Ephesians chapter 4. Stay stuck in the vanity of their imaginations. I think everybody, when we come to the Lord, we're legends in our own mind. Right? Hey, man, I know I was. I was a legend in my own mind. 
And that's okay because you ain't saved. But if you still think you're a legend in your own mind, after a couple years of salvation, something's wrong with you. Because it ain't about you, it's about him. It ain't about your hurt feelings. Because I've realized one thing, that most people do not intend to hurt your feelings. Most people. They're hurt. So they acted out of their hurt. And a mind that's been cleansed, imagination has been cleansed by God, all of us, those become peacemakers. Those are the ones, the Bible says, if a brother be taken a fault, you the spiritual restore such one. Those are the ones that help those individuals get restored, not take, not, not take offense at it and fight back. But we got individuals whose minds have not been, or imaginations have not been renewed or cleansed by the word, and they're propagating the same problems in the church. They're creating the divisions and the separatism within the church. And yet they profess, ah, man, I love God. How are you going to love God and hate your brother who you can't see and love God who you can't see? Your imagination is keeping you from the blessings and the promises of God. Your imagination is keeping you from the peace of God. One of the most astounding uh, scriptures in the Bible that I found that I've experienced to be real in my life, I found out my mother had died in, 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 in like five, ten minutes before I had to take the pulpit to preach. Long time ago. And I had a peace of God, and I was able to preach that day, that moment, five minutes before. Not that I didn't care. I was my mom, man. But I was able to function because of the peace that passes all understanding. Jesus said, my peace I give you. And it's amazing how many believers say they got peace, but they don't have it. They don't live like it, they don't talk like it, and they don't respond to people like they live in, in peace. The most astounding scripture I found is my peace I give unto you, not as the world give I give I unto you. That peace of God is a reality, but yet it's a missing component in the Christian faith today. Let's read. So this I say and solemnly testify in the name of the Lord as in his presence, that you must no longer live as heathen, the Gentiles do. Gentile means a people without God. You could be in church and be a people without God. Amen. Amen. I got God in name only, but I don't have him in my life. I don't, you don't see him in my actions. You don't hear him in my speech. You don't see him in my behavior. You don't see him in my works. Well, how's that going to happen? He's got, he, you know, he, 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 say, he, say, he tells us in the word, he says, he says in, the, in the day of judgment, he's going to say, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Didn't I cast out devils in your name? Didn't we feed the hungry? Didn't we clothe the naked? Didn't we visit the jail? He said, I never knew you. Coming to church can breed a false sense of confidence that you're saved. The Bible tells us we're supposed to examine ourselves to see if we're truly saved. How am I examining my by this word? Examine yourself by this word. What is your what is your imagination causing you to act like? What is your imagination causing you to think like? What is your imagination causing you to respond to other believers? If it's still the same way you used to, but a little bit more milder form, salvation may not be at your door. I'm not gonna make the statement say it isn't. I'm saying it may not be. You may be one of the herd that he said, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. What is your imagination? How is your imagination? Well, I don't go to church for this. You should go to church for this. You need to get built up in the faith. Don't come to church to hear something that's going to tickle your ear. Don't go to church that somebody's going to preach to your pocketbook. Go to find a church that somebody's going to build you up in the faith so that you can walk in faith and be, and be truly saved. Amen. That you must no longer live as the heathen do, the Gentiles, do in the perverseness and the folly, vanity and emptiness of their souls, and the futility of their minds, the emptiness of their imagination. He said, don't live like that any longer. God called us to be peacemakers, not dividers. That one thing there, if we, if we dictated and, and, and evaluated our Christian walk by that one scripture, that would eliminate how many of us? Are you a peacemaker? Well, I let nobody abuse me. Well, that's your pride. It's not about abuse. It's about preferring your brother or your sister. Where is your imagination? Who has your imagination? What has your imagination? 
It was so easy for me to believe in a living God after living for so many years not believing in God because I always had this thing in the back of my head. I didn't like the consequences of my sins, but I loved my sins. Three honest people here. I didn't like the consequences. I didn't like getting caught. I didn't like having to do what I had to do. I didn't like what it was doing to my body. I didn't like what it was doing to my mind. But I did, you know, uh, 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 but I liked the, the things I was doing. But I would imagine all the time, I can remember, you know, so many times taking a shower. Anybody ever feel dirty inside? Yes. Hey, man, I used to take a shower. I go, man, I just, I can't get clean. I would use zest and, you know, all this new stuff they said, go to Irish Spring, you know. It didn't work for me. I didn't feel clean. And it wasn't the outside that was bothering me. It was the inside, and I didn't know it. True. And I would imagine, man, I just wish there was a machine that I could walk through and get cleansed from inside out. I can remember many, many times thinking about that before I got saved. And when I got saved, truly saved, I was cleansed from the inside out by the washing of the regeneration of the word. It was a reality, so I realized that was something I wished for. God created it, and I had to learn how to walk in it. It wasn't a one-time experience where I come in, thank you, Jesus, I confess you as my Savior. I believe that you rose, you died from the dead, and I become a member of the church, put my name on the roster, give my dues, whatever. It wasn't, didn't work like that. It was a continual daily dying to myself. Daily dying to my wicked imagination. Not walking in the vanity of my imagination all the time. I had to daily consecrate myself, daily say, no, I'm going to refuse that. I'm walking in the newness of my mind. I'm walking in the newness of my imagination. I'm regenerated on a daily basis. But so many believers, they're content with coming to church and getting saved one day, and there's no more growth in their life. What happens to somebody in a trade, whatever trade it is, painting, mechanic, uh, 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 carpentry, doctor, right, gets out of school and he doesn't develop his skills. What happens to him? They don't get a job because they're unfit. Let me make you mad. Do you know how many believers are unfit? And in Paul's imagination, that was one of the things he was fearful of. He says, I don't want to be unfit and put on a shelf, but I want to be fit for the master's use. you got to imagine that God called you for a purpose and a plan, but your imagination is stopping you from becoming what he wants you to become because I think everybody's against me. I don't like this. I don't like that. Nobody asked you. What you God, do you think God cares what you like? What you don't like? I like what he told Job. He says, Job, where were you when I put the stars in the air? Where were you when I hung the moon up on nothing? You weren't there then, and I didn't ask you then, and I ain't asking you now. You know what God is saying? I want you to comply with me. I don't comply with you. See, many of us, we, you know, in our, in our vain imagination, we think, I'm going to hold my tithes and my offerings. God's going to get me, and God's going to give me what I want. I'm going to fast and pray, and God's going to give me what I want. I'm going to be of service. God's going to give me what I want. No, God gives you what he wants by grace. Not because of your merit, not because of your favor, not because of, fa not because of your favor, but because of his favor. Yes. Not because of your works, but because of his works. Yes. We, get it, we get it all twisted. Amen? Yes. Where's your imagination? 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Hallelujah. Let's read verse 5. Examine and test and evaluate your pastor. We do. Brother Charlie. No, that's Rachel's job. <laughs> Examine and test and evaluate your own self. You know the problem with that? Is our imagination covers up our flaws our short, our, our, and our shortcomings. It takes brutal honesty Amen. to see the wickedness of our own hearts. True. It takes brutal honesty to see when you're doing something for selfish gain and not doing it for God. 
We have a hard time evaluating ourselves like that. We can evaluate somebody else. But can you see yourself and stop yourself in mid-track and say, well, wait a minute. I'm really not doing this for the right reasons. And make an about turn. Evaluate your own selves to see whether you are holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. What are the fruits of your life right now? Are people attracted to you or are they repelled to you? See, people were attracted to John the Baptist. Here's a wild man in the wilderness eating wild locusts and honey. Separated from everybody. But by the thousands, they were going to hear him proclaim a message. They were attracted to Jesus. Jesus just tells somebody, hey, follow me. And they follow him. Drop everything without hesitation. Because there was something in him that, attra- that they were attracted to. The Apostle Paul, people were attracted to him. One man was attracted so much he, he neglected to sleep. Tired. Up on the roof, up on a window. Paul's preaching. He preached for so long. He said, I can't stop listening to this message. I'm tired. I should go to bed, but I can't tear myself away. When's the last time you heard a message like that? Most of us, 10 minutes into it, we're, oh my God. (laughs) Shame on you. He neglected to pull himself away to go to sleep. And he fell down out of the window dead. And Paul went up, revived him, and he preached again. The gospel of Jesus Christ, Christians are supposed to be attractive. So if there's a gauge to find out where you're at, how attractive are you? What are your fruits manifesting? You know, there are some fruits and plants that are poisonous. For instance, if you went down to a creek, most everybody knows what poison ivy looks like. Are you going to, oh well, and trample through it? But I want to get to the other side. I don't care how much I want to get to the other side. I've had poison ivy. I'm not going to go through it. I don't care if it's two miles out of my way. I will go two miles out of my way before I trample through it. How many people are going out of their way to avoid you? Because you're not good fruit, but you're poison ivy. What comes out of your mouth is not godly. What comes out of your mouth is not good. What comes out of your mouth is not just. And you call yourself a believer. Only in your imagination. And you may make it. The Bible says some people will make it by the skin of their teeth. But there will be a great loss of rewards. So they will be crying in heaven. Which boggled my mind. Why is it going to be crying in heaven? Man, heaven's great. Because at that point, you're going to realize, you should have realized today. But at that point, you're going to realize, you know what? I was walking in the vanity of my mind. I neglected the promises. I neglected the ability that was within me. I rejected the ability that was in me because I wanted to be right. We walk in the vanity of our own imagination. Fruits of it. Test and prove yourselves, not Christ. Do you know yourself to realize, know thoroughly by and ever increasing experience that Jesus Christ is in you? That takes an imagination. How can I believe Jesus is dwelling in me, the Holy Spirit's dwelling in me, and yet he's dwelling in Charlie and Johnny? Dwelling in everybody here that professes Christ as their Savior? I can't conceive that so I don't live like it. You see, you only live and operate out of your imagination. I truly believe that the Spirit of the living God dwells within me. I truly believe that he said, I will be your God, you shall be my people, I will dwell in you. Therefore, my imagination, I'm cognizant of what I'm saying. I'm mindful of how I converse to people. I'm mindful of how I make people feel. I'm mindful of how I respond to people, situations, and circumstances, because the Spirit of God is dwelling within Many of us would change our behavior, change our speech, change, our, change everything about us if you went home and found Jesus sitting on your couch. Amen. You go, oh, Jesus, good to see you today. How art thou? 
<laughs> Amen. You don't see him there. So you don't say, how art thou? You walk in the house and you say, who put this blank, blank, blank here? So and so, oh, screw him. I don't like him. Never invite him over here again. Wait a minute. Just because you can't imagine him being there don't mean he ain't there. He didn't ask your permission. You invited him in. You just are not acknowledging his presence. And because you can't imagine that, you live like he's not there. See, it's not your Bible reading. It's not your memory verses that's going to make you aware of God in you. It's your imagination that's going to make, God, uh, make you aware of God in you. I know that he's in me. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's not a figment of my imagination. It's the reality of my imagination. Amen. This pulpit was a figment of somebody's imagination before it was created. But after it was created, it was no longer a figment. It was no longer a picture in the imagine, imagination. It is the manifestation of their imagination. The manifestation of my imagination of God dwelling in me is now I sow good instead of sowing evil without any effort or because of surrender. It's, no longer, it's not behavioral modification. It was mind transformation. See, too many of us, we're, we're living in behavioral modification because you don't have the imagination. You think, that you, you think that you have to control your language. You have to control your profanity. You have to control your alcoholism. You have to control all these other things. It's not about uh, behavioral modification. It's about mind transformation. When you have the right imagination, you will see things through God's eyes and you will let them down. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Profanity don't hurt my ears. Right. I swore probably more than anybody in here. But profanity shows what's in your spirit. Yeah, yeah. The Bible says only what's in your heart comes out of you. Amen. Nothing else. Yeah. So if you're still spitting hate, bitterness, unforgiveness, strife, and you're not being a peacemaker, the spirit of being a peacemaker is not dwelling within you. I'm talking about you examining yourself today. I'm talking about laying down principles so you walk out of here. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you listen to the message, you'll determine whether you're in the faith or not. Amen. You should never go to church and have to walk out and wonder, wait, how, how was I living? The word ought to have exposed it because the Bible says the word, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, is that the word is quick and powerful and sharper than two of your sword is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God will expose our spirit, expose our character. And it, and it don't take imagination for it to do that. It don't, you, know, you know it's God working in you, through you, and you shut down. Because I want to do my thing. I don't want to surrender to him. I want to do my thing. It's important to know where our imagination is at because God operates and develops you through your imagination. We're not going to hear a cataclysmic, we're not going to have a cataclysmic experience or hear some voice in heaven that's going to turn your, voice, turn your life around. God's going to get you through, normally through the mundane little things in life. Right? How did he get Moses? He got Moses through the fiery bush. It didn't burn. It was a miracle. But the miracle wasn't that it didn't burn. The miracle was that it captured his imagination. See, there's bushes burning in the desert all the time, spontaneous combustion. It gets so hot, the weeds are so dry, they burn. It catches fire. Moses was aware of that, but he said, there's something different here. Let me turn aside and see what it is. God got his imagination. God got my imagination through a man, Skippy Cordova, and made me surrender and submit. The consequence of that was surrendering and submitting to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whenever there was a change in my walk, with God, it was he had captured my imagination. God tries to capture our imagination, and we're not spiritually in tune to see that it's God. Some of us need to be captured again and again and again and again because we're so spiritually dull. And There's a man in the Bible that was so spiritually dull. Several times God had to capture his imagination before he would act on it. Remember, you only act on what your imagination tells you to be true. 
Your faith only believes what your imagination tells it. If your imagination tells you it's not possible, guess what? Your faith tells you it's not possible. You don't even try it. Scripture says with God all things are possible. But you got to have, and when you have that imagination that with God all things are possible, you attempt to do something. You stop dreaming and you start making things become a reality because you know with God all things are possible. You stop talking about what you want to do and you start doing it. Turn your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 10. God captures you through your imagination. Let's read, starting at verse 9. The next day, as they were still on their way and were approaching the town, Peter went up to the roof of the house to pray about the sixth hour. There was, I don't think there was anybody more of a knucklehead of a disciple than Peter. How many Peters are here? But he became very hungry, and he wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, a trance came over him. He had an open-eyed vision. And he saw the sky open and something like a great sheet lowered by the four corners descending to the earth. It contained all kinds of quadrupeds and wild beasts and creeping things of the earth, the birds of the air. And there came a voice to him saying, rise up, Peter, kill and eat. You gotta remember, the, 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 the Jews had a strict dietary lifestyle. They didn't eat certain things because they were considered unclean. God's trying to direct him and tell him, I'm going to send you to a people that are unclean. It was a sin for a Jew to go to a Gentile's house. They separated themselves to that point. They didn't touch the unclean thing. And so God was trying to show him through this vision, through his imagination, that I have a purpose for the unclean, and I'm going to send you there. But Peter said, no, no, me, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unclean and common and hallowed or ceremonial unclean. Stuck there? Thank you. And the voice came to him again a second time. How many times God had to give, speak to you the same time? How many times God had to deal with your imagination before you said, oh, I guess that's God? We're in the same boat. You know, we think the patriarchs of old, man, and we think, consider them. So, oh my God, they're so great. They walked on water. They got the same issues we did. That's why it's Romans 15, 4. So whatever things were written in earlier time, written us for us for an example. If you read the word, you might be okay with yourself and lighten up instead of beating up yourself all the time. Every time I fall short, I think about somebody else in the Bible that had the same issue and yet they overcame. But when your imagination has been, been, not been washed by the word, you keep belittling yourself and saying, I'm not worthy, I'm no good, so I'm not even going to try anymore. Yes. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, not a lack of understanding, a lack of knowing. And the voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed and pronounced clean, do not what? Defile and Profane by regarding and calling common and unhallowed or unclean. This occurred not once, not twice, three times. Talk about a knucklehead. How many times has God had to speak to us? It doesn't matter how many times, as long as you get it. As long as you get it. This occurred three times. Then immediately the sheet was taken up to heaven. The vision was gone. Then there's a call for him downstairs. This Cornelius is down here. And then, after everything was in line, he goes, I perceive that God wants me to go with you. All of a sudden, what he imagined became understandable. And he acted on it. Our imagination, God operates through that imagination. It captivates you through that imagination. And it may, it may have to take him one, two, three, four, or 104 times to get to you. Before you see, and the problem is not him. We're asking God for answers. He's answering us, but we're not seeing it because it's not coming the way we want it. I want an answer this specific way. God says, no, I'm going to show you this way, and you follow in that way. 
But my imagination can't follow that. Go to Genesis chapter 15, start at verse 5. Hallelujah. Let's read. Abraham, the father of faith. God's instilling within him what he needs for his journey. Many individuals try to have a walk with God without having an imagination for God. They hear the message. The pulpits do a poor job of developing the believers to walk in faith. And instead of helping them develop the relationship, they try to help them develop ministry. You don't get that before relationship. Abraham had a relationship with God. God spoke to him. The Bible says he was a friend of God. And he brought him outside of his tent into the starlight and said, look now towards the heavens and count the stars. What's he doing? He's developing his imagination. He could have just came down and told him, he said, look, you're going to have a whole bunch of kids. You're the father of faith. You're going to be able to lend to the countries. But he, ha- he wanted to paint a picture so he could see it. See, our future is not bright because we don't see it. You see your future like your past. Dim. Painful. Close the door and see the future as bright as you want it to be. And he brought him outside the tent into the starlight and said, Look now towards the heavens and count the stars. If you are able to count them or number them, he said to him, so shall your descendants be. He says, you see all these stars? I never saw stars. I'm born and bred here. I mean, I'm born and bred here in the Bay Area, Oakland, man. You know, we don't see stars the way stars are out there. Amen. One of the times I was in the Philippines, one of the islands out there, and there was, no, there was nothing there but just, the, they did not need lights. Street lights because the stars were so bright. I was mesmerized by the stars, and this came to my mind, and God told Abraham, he says, if you can count those, that's how many children you're going to have. You get a promise from God. How many feel good when you get a promise from God? And then life happens. Right? Life happens all of a sudden, man. You lose your imagination, what God said you would have, or what God said you would do. Things, you know, uh, uh, negative things happen. You go the wrong way. You make mistakes, and you forget about the promise. As I said, every man and woman in the Bible is just like you and I. Life happened to Abraham. Going to have a child, going to have a child. I'm going to be the father of faith. My descendants are going to be like the stars. And then life happened. Temptation came. And the problem about that temptation is his wife aided him in it. His wife helped him. Go to Genesis chapter 16. Let's read one and two. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, now he told his wife, he says, God told, spoke to me. We're going to have a child. We're going to have descendants upon descendants upon descendants. And I thought about this. I said, you know what? His wife was just trying to do the right thing to help her husband. And when the man of God in the house does not have his place of purpose according to the word of God, he will allow himself to be led astray by his wife. I know that's not going to go well with the women here right now. But you are supposed to be the head of the house. Amen. I'm the head of my house, not the head of your house. And I know younger kids today don't ascribe to that. And if you're young here today, you need to get in the Word and you find out what it means. Because your, your, your faith, your home will never be in order. And when I say that, I don't mean a caveman beating my wife over the head and dragging her by the head. Say, where's my meal? Where's my meal, what woman? Ain't like that at all, man. You know, the Bible says that we're supposed to treat them as a, 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 a little translation is as a fragile piece of china. And if you don't, your prayers are hindered. If you don't, your prayers are hindered. 
Amen. Now, Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had made an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abraham, See here, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. I'm asking you to have intercourse with my maid. You know, he probably never thought about this. He probably never even thought about it until his wife suggested it. And then his imagination goes, she don't look too bad. He probably started following her with his eyes. Because he had to have the same imagination as her. She had to push her imagination on him. Because he could have said, should have said, no, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither, or God, that he should repent. Hath he not said it, shall he not make it good? He should have said that. But she piqued his interest with her imagination. Amen. Hagar. Name don't sound good, but she's looking pretty good. <laughs> Amen. I like, I like a woman named Gomer. <laughs> Amen. And listen to this. And the Bible says, and he obeyed. And he obeyed. I guarantee you that was probably the only thing he obeyed her about. Life happened. He had an imagination to believe God. And then his imagination, because of a time lapse of the fulfillment of the promise, his imagination started running wild with him. Maybe God made a mistake. Maybe it wasn't meant for me. Maybe I'm supposed to help God. Amen. He could even say, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, my imagination goes wild with me with this one, man. Amen. Have intercourse with my man. My wife would shoot me. If I even thought anything, if I, if, if, if I dreamed that and was sleep talking, <laughs> I'm going to wake up with a black eye. <laughs> Amen. Can't imagine what's going on in their mind, man. But life showed up. So now life shows up. What happens? Did God judge him? Did God condemn him? No, he says, you know what? You were not supposed to have this child. But I am going to bless this child. But every person that is ever born will be against him. He will be a great nation. Today that nation has risen up. It is still powerful. And every hand is against them. And they, and, and, and they are against every hand. Amen. I'm not going to go into it because some people don't. They think I'd be talking political. I'm not talking political. I'm talking biblical. Two great nations came out of Abraham, but one was the greatest. Right. Amen. So what God had to do was reinstate his imagination to give him the faith to follow through. Because again, without the imagination, you don't have the faith to follow through. You got to see this picture in your mind in order to follow through with it. Um, there's been some boxers, some great boxers in the past, Muhammad Ali, and you know, uh, you know, he's the greatest as far as I'm concerned. And he never saw himself anything other than the greatest. He never spoke about himself other than being the greatest. When he beat Sonny Liston, right? When he beat Sonny Liston, and he was just 24 years of age, I think, maybe even younger than that. Right after he beat him, he says, I am the greatest. In his imagination, he was the greatest, and he proved himself to be the greatest. His imagination got renewed every time he got in the ring. When you fail, your imagination needs to be renewed. But when you think that you're worth nothing because you failed, you can't see or hear God trying to restore your imagination to have faith to follow through. You will, you will succumb to the, to, uh, to the whims of the enemy. Go over to um, Genesis chapter 22. Did we read Genesis 17, 5? Okay, 17, 5. I'm sorry. 
He had to reinstate a right imagination in Abraham. So you may be sitting on a fence, bemoaning, woe is me. Allow God to reinstate you by rekindling your imagination. Let's read. Nor shall your, he's speaking to him again. This is after he had a child. He goes, you're not going to be Abraham, but now you're going to be Abram, the father of many. But wait a minute, Lord, don't you know what I've done? I slept with Hagar. I blew it. I messed up. I'm unfit. Wait a minute, that imagination didn't work. Let me fix you a little bit more. Genesis chapter 22. Hallelujah. Let's read. Listen to what he's saying. In blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your descendants. Like the stars of the heavens and like the sands on the sea. Sure. And your seed hair will possess the gates of the enemy. Now I want a little bit more. He said, wait a minute. Not just the stars, but the sands. And it's said that the sands of the sea he said that for a specific reason they did not wear italian shoes he did not wear cowboy boots tennis shoes jordans they didn't have that they had sandals they were desert dwellers what's in the desert so every day he's walking when the sand gets between his toes he's thinking "Ooh, that's george that's john that's pete Amen. That's Lucy. That's Sally. That's Bobby. Those are, those are my heirs in there. Every time he saw the sand, every time he wanted to complain about the sand, he'd think about, that's my heir. You ever go to the beach and get sand, come home, you got sand in places you didn't know sand can get into? <laughs> he said, I'm not going to complain because my imagination, that's my seed there. God gave him something he can identify with to help him maintain the imagination that God gave him so that he could fulfill the promises in his life. Because if you give up on your imagination, you give up on believing God for it, you sit down, you put your hands on, uh, 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 un, un, under your seat, and you just sit there, you become unfit for the master's use, and you're unfit. You're just there. You're just sitting here. How many believers are just sitting here when you've been anointed and appointed of God? Listen to this. You've been anointed and appointed of God. What's keeping you from operating in that anointing and that appointment? Your imagination. I just can't see that to be done. I just can't imagine God using me. He can. That's all that matters. Abraham's failure didn't mean nothing to God. He reinstated his imagination. Now he didn't tell, he didn't tell him, just tell him you're going to be father. He's going to be the father of Many, a multitude of many. Not just the stars, but the sands of the sea. Sandstorm, looking out his tent. There goes my kids. <laughs> Keeping the imagination alive. What's killing your imagination? You know, it, it, it's funny. You, know, you, you see some of the young people that get married and, and uh, uh, they get all excited and I want five kids. I want six kids. I want seven kids. And after one, I go, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. The imagination was better than the experience. <laughs> but not so with God. Right? But some of them maintain that, man. Is, you know, I want five kids. You know, I think, amen. God bless them. <laughs> Anthony and Vanessa just had their first baby, and still they want five. But he hasn't hit two yet. He hasn't hit three. <laughs> he hasn't hit 15 or 16 when they know it all. Amen. But according to their faith. Amen. I'm saying that, leave them alone. If they want five, don't tell them about the five bad ones you had. Amen. <laughs> Did you learn something this morning? Come on, give the Lord a praise. Amen. The vision of Abraham's imagination created or helped him to see what faith knows to be true. Faith knows it to be true, but your imagination.